welcome to Resurrection Day at Lighthouse Community. He is risen, right? Oh, man. We are celebrating the greatest moment in all of history, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And because of his resurrection, what I think is so amazing is every single one of us has the opportunity to experience forgiveness in our lives. That's kind of what we're talking about a little bit today. So I want you to do me a favor. Look at a person next to you and say the word forgiveness. Great. Hey, if you're joining online, type forgiveness into the chat. So forgiveness is amazing because if you need it, but you can't get it, it'll make you desperate. Forgiveness is amazing because if you refuse to give it away, it will actually make you bitter and hard-hearted. And if you have forgiveness, if you're generous with forgiveness, it'll actually change lives in the process. Forgiveness is this amazing word, this amazing concept. And today, what I want to show you from the Bible is I want to show you what forgiveness is. I want to show you how you can get it. And then I want to invite all of us into one step that will actually lead you to enjoy forgiveness in your own life. So if you brought a Bible with you, I'm going to ask you to open up to Luke chapter 15. Luke is the third book in the New Testament. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke. We're going to be in chapter 15 today. Uh, or you can click over there on your device. While you're going there, I do want to welcome you. My name is Fritz. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm really glad you're with us today. Um, we have been praying for you all week long. We've been preparing for you all week long. And if this is your first time here, I want to say thank you for joining us. Thank you for risking this morning to come and to be a part of this community um, that you would say, man, I want to be somewhere that's going to help me discover who God is with clarity. That's been our prayer. That's been our hope all week long. And actually, not only is it Resurrection Day, but we're also kicking off a brand new series called Your Guide to a Life of Joy and Purpose. And what we're going to do over the next three weeks is we're actually going to look at three really important words. Forgiveness, repentance, and then the $20 theological word, justification. And we're going to talk about why all of those things matter deeply and how they can actually lead you to a life of joy and purpose. And so before we dive in, I would like to take a moment and pray together. So I'm going to ask you if you're here in the house or you're joining us online, if you'll bow your heads and pray with me. God, we want to thank you so much. Uh, we sense your presence in this place. And more than anyone else, I want to hear from you. The, the, my friends and family here today, they want to hear from you. And so please don't allow our attention to be put on any human being, uh, any person here in this room. May your Holy Spirit draw our attention to the work of the Holy Spirit in us and among us. And may we hear you with amazing clarity through the scriptures um, today, and that would begin to transform our lives through faith. We ask these things in the great name of Jesus, and everyone said, yeah. amen. Okay, we're in Luke 15. We're actually going to start about halfway through, which is verse 11. Uh, I'm going to read through this, and then I want to share a couple of thoughts with you. Verse 11, Luke 15 says this, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his census, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, 
Bring the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this uh, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, this is a story that I just don't think needs a lot of explanation into the details of what's going on. It's very uh, plain, very straightforward to understand what's happening here. But I want you to know that's what this is. This is a story. This isn't an account. This is what's known as a parable. And something to understand about a parable, anytime you see one in the Gospels and Jesus is sharing a parable, you have to understand there is, he's intentionally sharing one surprising point. That's what parables are for. They reveal this one surprising point. And I'm going to tell you right now what the point is that Jesus wants all of us to see. It's this. God's forgiveness is outrageous. That is the point that Jesus is helping us to see. That God's outrageous or God's forgiveness is outrageous. Now, there's two aspects I want to bring out about this, about God's forgiveness. And here's the first one, is that God's forgiveness is outrageously wonderful if you're the younger brother, right? God's forgiveness, right? His forgiveness is outrageously wonderful if you're the younger brother. When Jesus tells this parable, how he sets the younger brother up, he puts the younger brother's selfishness on display. See, what happens here is, like, when, when do most kids get inherent, inheritance from their parents? It's when they die, right? Well, this son is so self-centered, he comes to his dad and says, I want your stuff more than I want you. In fact, I wish you were dead. This is what the younger brother is saying. I wish you were dead. I want your stuff. I don't want you. So father goes, well, okay. The son goes and liquidates all of the property and then heads off to a distant land. And he wasted it on reckless living. Somehow the older brother finds out and says, you know what he spent it most, mostly on? Prostitutes. He spent his, this money. He spent his inheritance on prostitutes and everything that goes along with that. And then when this younger brother lost everything, Scripture says he came to his senses. He's starving. He doesn't know what to do. And all of a sudden he goes, maybe I can go home and my dad, I know I can't be a son anymore. I know what I've done but maybe he'll hire me as a worker and I can live. So he sets off home. Can you, can you imagine just for a moment, what do you think could have been going through the younger brother's mind as he's traveling home? You know, I'm thinking some thoughts that are coming through his mind. He's trying to play out, what am I going to say? How is this going to go? What's my dad going to say in response? My guess is he's expecting that when he gets home, his father's going to go, you wanted me dead so you could have my stuff? Guess what? Now you're dead to me. You have no place here. You made your bed. Now go lie in it. Right? That that's probably what he's expecting is going to happen. The the best that he can hope for is his dad goes, Oh, you want a job? Okay, we'll give you a job. You can go to the stalls and shovel. Right? That's what you can do. You'll spend the rest of your life shoveling. That'll be it. That's what he that's what I imagine he's probably expecting he's going to encounter. Here's the question though, what did he get? compassion. 
compassion. When he was in eyesight, the father runs to him with compassion. He receives love. He receives forgive uh, for restoration. What does he receive? He receives forgiveness. It goes so, it's, it's just such to the level, they actually throw a party for this whole thing. I mean, they threw a rager for this. You don't kill the fattened calf unless you're really living it up, right? Like, that's what's going on here. Can you imagine how surprising this would have been for the younger brother? How humbling this would have been? How wonderful it would have been for the younger brother to experience this? And so Jesus is helping us to see that, that God's forgiveness is outrageously wonderful if you're the younger brother. There's another side to this story, right? That's the second point about God's forgiveness, is that God's forgiveness is outrageously offensive. If you also put your tasers on stun, if you haven't already. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. beep me up, Scotty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That God's forgiveness is outrageously offensive if you're the older brother. His forgiveness is outrageously offensive if you're the older brother. See, you have to understand, when the younger brother does what he does and he sets off, it's the older brother who stayed home. It's the older brother who watched how his dad navigated this right in front of his eyes. It's the older brother who worked the fields every single day. It was the older brother who stayed as a good son. He did all of the right things. Somehow, word had traveled back to the older brother of what was going on in the younger brother's life. Because he knew. He knew what had happened. He knew what had taken place. And I can imagine when the older brother is out there working in the fields, there's some days where he's going, you know what? Someday he's coming home. I know he's going to come home and I can't wait till he comes home because when he does, we're going to let him have it. I know I've been watching dad cry. I've been seeing this whole thing play out. And when he comes home and he asked if he can be let back into the family, we're going to tell him no. Oh, I can't wait for that day. That's going to be a really good day. And, and in all honesty, like transparently, I, I understand the older brother's anger. I mean, don't you? Like, you? like, isn't there a level where you can get it? It's like, wait a second, this guy wasted. His, he said he wanted dad dead, and then he wasted this in here. Didn't even invest it, right? I'm guessing, like, if Dave Ramsey was back in the day, like, the older brother calls and he goes, listen, my dad gave the inheritance away to my younger brother. He's blown it. So now the rest is to me. What do you think I should do? And Dave's like, well, I think I ought to be in a 401k and IRA, and, you know. <laughs> Is your, is your father mentally unstable, uh, right? Like this kind of stuff. And so the older brother is working through all of this. This forgiveness is outrageous. In fact, it's insulting. It's insulting that the father would, it's offensive. It's foolish that the father would forgive the younger brother like this. You're, you're waste, now you're wasting my inheritance again. On your son. And so what Jesus is doing is he wanted his listeners, he wanted us to see that God's forgiveness is outrageous. It's simply outrageous. Now, Jesus, this is one of the, one of the many reasons why I really believe Jesus was a master teacher. In, in telling this parable, what he's doing is he's inviting you and me, all of his listeners, to identify with a person in the story. Right? He's inviting you to identify with either the younger brother or the older brother. Because none of us can identify with the father. Right? That's, that's a reserved for the Lord alone. So we're either the younger brother or we're the older brother. And so I was thinking, you know, what are ways that you might know if you're the younger brother? Right? Uh, you, know, you might be an older brother if. And I was just you know, kind of thinking about that. You guys remember in the 90s and early 2000s, there was a guy by the name of Jeff Foxworthy who would say, you know, you might be a redneck if. It's kind of like, you know, if you've ever advertised in a bathroom stall, you might be a redneck, right? Like that's what he'll do. And so by the way, uh, you can, if you didn't sign up, you can sign up for a small group in the bathroom. There's QR codes in there. Just, uh, just thinking about that. Um, some of you guys are going to go in there and check. And you're going to sign up for a small group because the QR code's in there, all right? Um, and he goes, this real? Right? But so, 
So Jesus is saying, who do you identify with, the younger brother or the older brother? And you, you might be the younger brother if you've spent your life living according to your own rules. I do what I want when I want. You might be a younger brother if your focus is only on the now without regard to how your choices affect the people who are connected to your life. You might be a younger brother if you come one day, you wake up and you look at your life and you go, how did I get here? And more importantly, how do I get out? You might be a younger brother if you're feeling trapped in your current situation. You know, I, I relate to the younger brother. That, that was my story without Jesus. I, I lived however I wanted to. I did not care what you thought about me. Um, I did what I want, when I want, with who I wanted, whenever I wanted to. That was my story. That's, that's how I lived. And so I identify far more with the younger, younger brother. And maybe some of you, maybe you identify with the younger brother. But then there's others in this room. There's others who are joining online. You're going, younger brother? No, I don't get that at all. I didn't do any of that stuff. And so you identify more with the older brother. And so you might be an older brother if you've always followed the rules and done what was expected of you. You might be a younger brother if you live by the motto, do good things and good things happen. You could be an older brother if you really believe that everybody gets what they deserve and that's exactly how it should work. You might be an older brother if you feel helpless and trapped in how to get outside of that mindset. You might be an older brother if you actually struggle to find joy when other people are blessed, and from your perspective, it doesn't seem like they deserve it, that they didn't do anything to earn it. Now, I, was, I never really was the older brother and saw it in that way, but I did have an older brother moment one time that I can remember. I was about seven or eight years old, and my middle sister, Michelle, her birthday is on the 4th of July. And it always bothered me that she got fireworks on her birthday, <laughs> and I didn't get any on mine. That doesn't seem fair. So, so then this one birthday, my mom decides, hey, we're going to go to the mall, and Michelle can basically pick out whatever she wants. A mall was this place where stores used to meet <laughs> and you would buy stuff. And there really weren't that many people walking for exercise. They were walking for shopping. We went to the mall and we're going from store to store. And every store, like Chris, my, my sister's looking at stuff. And every store I'm going, hey, can I have no? Hey, can I have no? Hey, I, you know, I'm asking for me, but I really want no. But I need this. So it, like everything's no. We're here for your sister. This is her birthday. You're not getting anything. So then I just start thinking really practically, what is the one thing my mom would not say no to so that I can have something on my sister's birthday? And I remember we're walking through the common area of the mall and I'm behind my mom. And I'm like, can I at least? get a haircut right and no <laughs> no right I could not stand the thought that my sister would get blessed and I wouldn't and she still had fireworks to come later that night right that's an older brother moment and, and what Jesus is saying is that whether you're a younger brother or whether you're an older brother, whoever you identify with, that's fine. But it doesn't matter because everybody needs God's outrageous forgiveness. You see, the younger brother needs God's forgiveness for his reckless, wild living, living as if there was no God at all. The younger brother needs forgiveness for that. But the older brother, the older brother needs forgiveness for thinking that he can manipulate God by good religious living and make him do things for him. That somehow the older brother, by being good and doing everything that's right, can put God in his debt, that when he pulls the right spiritual levers, that God has to give him the spiritual toy that he's asking for. The older brother needs forgiveness for that while he stands in judgment over everybody else. I want you to look back at Luke chapter 15, but not at the part that we read. I want to go back to verses 1 and 2. These verses are so important when you're understanding, especially this parable of the forgiving father. Verses 1 and 2 say this, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. 
What brother is the tax collector and the sinner? This is the younger brother. The younger brothers are listening to Jesus tell the story. Look at verse 2. There's another group there. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. The older brother's present. See, Jesus tells this parable because he knows the younger brothers and the older brothers are right there listening. And he's trying to expose for them that we all need God's outrageous forgiveness. It does not matter. We need it. And he talks about this idea of a party. Right? This idea of a party. Every time we've got to celebrate, we've got to celebrate all of this stuff. And the, one of the points that's a part of understanding God's outrageous forgiveness is this, is that God provides his forgiveness for you to enjoy. God provides his forgiveness for you to enjoy. Doesn't that statement in and of itself just sound outrageous? It's like forgiveness, enjoy. Isn't this where you come to somebody with your tail tucked between your legs and you're full of remorse and sorrow and all of that stuff and you hope and you beg and you plead and maybe possibly they'll forgive me. And yet, every time God's forgiveness is put on display in Luke 15, there's always a party. There's always a celebration. There's always joy. Because we're invited to enjoy God's forgiveness. How do you do that? How do you enjoy God's forgiveness? I'm going to tell you. Two ways. There's a lot of different ways, but here's two ways very quickly. First one, you have to experience God's forgiveness for yourself. That's the only way you can enjoy it. You have to experience God's forgiveness for yourself. And, And there's a level you have to understand what forgiveness is. I think this is a word that gets thrown around, but I don't know that we fully grasp everything. So let me tell you very quickly what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is the canceling of a debt. In its purest form, that's what forgiveness is. You owe a debt. If it's forgiven, it means it's been canceled and you don't owe it anymore. That's what forgiveness is. And we tend to think of it in that terms, right? We're canceling the debt. You don't owe anything. You've been forgiven. And that's true. And that's exciting. But the other half of forgiveness is this. In order for a debt to be canceled, someone has to take the hit. Somebody has to absorb the cost so that your debt can be canceled. It just doesn't get vanished into thin air. Somebody has to absorb the cost of your debt. When I was 19 years old, I moved into my first apartment by myself. I don't know how this happened, but the Lord gave me a first floor condo on the the beach of Lake Erie in Port Clinton. And that was my first home. It was amazing. And I thought, you know what this house needs? A pool table. And so, and so I bought a pool table, right? This slate pool table. Now I understand why they were selling it. But, right, they bought this slate pool table, and me and my friend were like, we're going to get this into my apartment. We can do this. We're 19. We're strong. Once we carry like three feet, we're like, we're not doing that anymore. So what did we do? We came with this great idea. Just push it down the hallway. So we did. We pushed this pool table down the hallway. We get all the way to my door, kind of take a break, turn around and look back, and there's this burn mark in the carpet that leads all the way to my door. (laughs) Do you think they'll know who did it? (laughs) So I'm like, well, what are we going to do? Let's get in, set it up, and play pool before we get in trouble, right? So that's what we did. We set up, and about an hour later, get a knock on the door from the guy that, you know, like runs the the condo or whatever. He's like, you're going to pay for this. I was like, yeah, yeah. It was over. And I didn't think anything else about it. And then letters started showing up. You owe this much. It's like $2,000 or $2,000 to replace this strip of carpet. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that'll take care of itself. Then the letters started coming in pink. Then you know, right? I'm 19. I don't know anything. Yeah, throw them away. Then, the, then phone calls start being made, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, goodbye. And the last phone call actually grabbed my attention. They're like, listen, you owe this money. And you either pay this money or we're going to take you to court. And when we take you to court, we're going to garnish your wages. You're probably going to get thrown in jail. We're going to take your driver's license away from you too. And I'm like, yeah. (laughs) So I did what any 19-year-old man would do. I called my mommy. (laughs) And I called my mommy, and I told them what had happened. I said, Mom, this is what's going on. We hung up. 
I never got another phone call or letter again from that company. And my mom, here's what I believe happened, that my mom paid that debt off, and we never talked about it again. That's how it went. You see, in order for a debt to be canceled, somebody has to take the hit. Somebody has to absorb the cost. God has canceled your debt of sin because Jesus took the hit for you. Jesus absorbed the cost of your sin. This is what his death on the cross and his resurrection is about. In fact, his resurrection, the fact that God raised him from the dead, is the exclamation point that Jesus' death is final, full payment for all people of all time for all sin. This is why we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the only way that you can experience God's forgiveness for yourself is to turn away from your brand of sin, whatever it is, reckless living or do-goodism and keeping the law. Both of those things you have to turn away and you have to put all of your trust and all of your hope in the work and the person of Jesus Christ. And when you see the reality that what Jesus has done for you is enough, and there's nothing to add to it, that's when you begin to experience God's forgiveness. This is why John, the apostle, writes in his letter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. In fact, let's do this. Let's read this verse uh, out loud together. Uh, first, Yep, there we go. Starting with, if we confess our sins. Are you ready? Go. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all this is what John is talking about. We turn away from whatever that brand of sin is and we put our trust in Jesus Christ. That's when forgiveness comes. And I remember when I first experienced God's forgiveness through faith in Jesus. For me, I just, the only way I can describe it is I felt new. I felt new. Other people, as they tell me their story, they've described that when they came to faith and received God's forgiveness, it was like a weight that had been lifted off their shoulder or off their chest. And then there's others who said, man, when I put my faith in Jesus, I didn't feel anything. But I knew it was true. I just knew it was in the depths of my being. And so in order for you to enjoy God's forgiveness, you actually have to experience it for yourself. The other side of that is this, is when you've truly experienced God's forgiveness, this is the other half of enjoying God's forgiveness. When you've experienced God's forgiveness for yourself, you give it away to others. You actually give it, this is how you enjoy God's forgiveness. You actually give it away to other people. See, the Holy Spirit actually will empower you to give God's forgiveness away to other people. And I get it. People have hurt you. People have hurt me. You have hurt people. And chances are, Someone's going to hurt you in the future. It's just, it's just a likelihood. The question is, what do you do? What do you do? You forgive. If you're in Christ, you forgive. You cancel the debt. You, you do for others what Jesus has done for you. You absorb the cost. I want you to think about somebody who's hurt you at some point in your life. doesn't matter. It could be massive, could be minor. Here's the question. What could they do to make it right as if it never happened? Seriously, what could that person do to make it right as if it never happened? When you begin to peel past the layers and get, you know, you know what the answer is? Nothing. There's nothing they can do. There's no amount of sorries. They can't, right? You, they crawled on their knees for 20 miles, right? And begging for your forgiveness, like, there's nothing. You know, you know how you break free from the bitterness of being hurt? You forgive. You cancel the debt. You just absorb the cost and go, I'm never, I'm never going to be able to receive payment to make it even. And so I'm going to absorb the cost. What's amazing. But by the way, you can only do that if you've experienced God's forgiveness for yourself. You can't give it away if it hasn't been given to you. 
But as you give away forgiveness to others, God uses that as an open door so that others can begin to enjoy his forgiveness as well. I want you to do me a favor and just look on the, grab that blue connection card that uh, the mats had mentioned uh, earlier in the service. Uh, that blue connection card, pull that out, flip it over on the back. There's two next steps I want to draw your attention to that may help you. The first one says, I'm learning how to enjoy God's forgiveness. That, what that next step is about is to say, man, we want to pray for you as you're stepping into that. The other next step I want to draw your attention to is to say, perhaps one way that you could grow in this and learn to enjoy God's forgiveness is to simply come back next Sunday and to be a part of the rest of our series of your life, your guide to a life of joy and purpose. And you could step into that. And what I'm just asking is you to mark one of those next steps, if if God's leading you to do that, and let me know, because I just want to pray for you. That's it. I want to be able to pray for you. Uh, That's all I'm looking to do. And so if you would let me know, I think that would be remarkable. But there's something about enjoying God's forgiveness that actually causes people to lean into that as well. Now, I was raised, many of you know who are part of Lighthouse Community, you know that I was raised by my alcoholic father for most of my life. And if you know anything about that, you know that there are pieces that come with that, right, that are unpleasant And so I didn't come to faith in Jesus Christ until after I was a little bit older. And so I came to Christ, I came to faith in Christ and him. And then I got married not too long after that. And there was a point where my dad had been doing some things, saying some things that were very, very hurtful. And so I made the decision, I'm not talking to him anymore. And I didn't for a year. I didn't call him. I didn't check in on him. I didn't care. I just didn't talk to him. And then one day I sensed... In in a time of prayer, I sense God saying to me, you need to go talk to your dad. And I'm going, no, God. And so, in short, I went (laughs) after I got permission from my wife. And we were living in in Mansfield at the time, and so I drove two hours home to Port Clinton. And I went right to where I knew my dad would be, the bar. So I pulled up, his truck was there, I walked in and sat down next to him at the bar. And he was surprised to see me. We started talking and chit-chatting and all that kind of stuff. And we started to get towards the end of the evening and I could tell my dad was in no condition to drive. So I said, Dad, I'll drive you home. So I drove him home and we're sitting in front of his door. And I'm just sensing the Lord going, you got to talk to him, you got to talk to him. And so I looked over at my dad who's in the passenger seat and I told him, I forgive you. You might not even think you need to be forgiven, but I need to let you know, and you need to hear me say, I forgive you for everything, all of it. I'm not holding it against you anymore. You know what happened in that car? Nothing. (coughs) Nothing. Nothing happened that night. In fact, my dad sat there blankly staring out the windshield, didn't even look at me. And then after what felt like about 73 days, opened the door without a word and walked into his house. And I drove home going, well, that was a thing. What I didn't know was that God was going to use that moment five years later that actually opened up the door for my dad to experience God's forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ. And today, my dad is enjoying the full experience of God's forgiveness in eternity with joy unending for all of the rest of eternity, right? Like, I think about that reality that God used that forgiveness to change his life and quite frankly, to change my life too. Who are you withholding forgiveness from? Who who are you requiring a payment from? If you have received God's forgiveness, it's actually time for you to give it away. To allow others to enjoy it through you. That this could be an open door for them to experience and enjoy God's forgiveness for themselves. 
You can't give it away until you've experienced it yourself. And so that giving it away, that's only for the Christ followers in the room. But if you've never experienced God's forgiveness for yourself, here's what I would say to you. Come home. Whether you're the younger brother or the older brother, come home. There's love, there's compassion, there's forgiveness for you. The reason I know that is because of Psalm 103. Psalm 103 says this, that he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. And so come home. Enjoy God's outrageous forgiveness that he has for you through Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to bow your heads and to close your eyes. We, we end every message every weekend the exact same way, which is asking a question, and it's this. Jesus, what are you saying to me through this message right now? And I want to give you an opportunity to listen for him. One of the ways that you might know that Jesus is speaking to you is simply that this morning, it, maybe it was a, a, a line from a song, maybe it was a, a passage from the scripture, maybe it was a, a truth that was shared with you and it's just stuck with you and it's like, it's come right back to the forefront of your mind right now. That's likely Jesus speaking to you and asking you, think about this, wrestle with this, don't ignore it, don't stiff arm it step into it. One of the ways you enjoy this forgiveness is actually giving it away to other people who don't deserve it, right? But neither do you. So so for some of you, you know that God is asking you to give away forgiveness to other people And and you're wrestling in your heart and in your mind right now. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to take a step of courage. If you're here today and you know, I know God is asking me to forgive another person, but I don't really want to. I'm afraid of what that means. I'm afraid of what that will look like. Here's what I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you to take a step of courage. Just heads are bowed, eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. And I just want you, if you're in the house this morning, I just want you to raise your hand so I can know to pray for you. So if, right on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand if you're going, I know God wants me to forgive somebody. I'm afraid to do it. Lift your hand up nice and high. Put your hand up right now. Put it up. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. I get it. Man, know that you're not alone. Know that you're not alone. The Spirit is with you. God is with you. Thank you for being honest and transparent. God, I pray you would empower these people. They are doing a big, massive thing and they're wrestling through what does that mean and what does that look like? And my prayer is that you would help them to lean on you and to trust you. That if they can enjoy it, perhaps other people can enjoy your forgiveness through them too. I want to talk to another group of people just really quickly. You're here this morning you're going, wow, I need God's forgiveness. I am the younger brother. I am the older brother. And I need God's forgiveness. And I'm seeing for the first time, I don't have to pay for it. I don't have to earn it. I don't have to be good enough that God gives it away to me freely as I am. And then he transforms me on the back end of that. If you're here this morning and you're going, man, I need God's forgiveness. I know I need it. And I'm ready for it today. I'm going to put my faith. I'm going to put my trust. I'm going to trust him to the best that I can and believe he's going to do something with that. If that's you this morning, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand so that I can be praying for you as well. So if you're at the place going, man, I'm ready to receive God's forgiveness in my own life. Just raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand right now. Let me see that. Yep, I see that in the back. I see this here. Yes. Yeah, right here in the middle. Oh, man. Yep, right here in the middle. Amen. Anyone else? Yep, I see this in the front. Wow. Wow. Anyone else? Just lift your hand up. Man, wow. Hey, man, you can put your hands on. Guys, there, there's like 10 people who are saying yes to Jesus and they're wanting God's forgiveness in their life this morning. Only God does that. 
Only God does that. I want to pray. I'm going to pray for you, but also this is the time that we pray for one another. So I'm going to set up a few things, and then I want to pray for us. So I'm going to ask the band to come up. They're going to lead us in one more song. I'm going to ask our prayer leaders if you'll head to the corners now so people know that you're ready to receive them in prayer. And, and here's what we do. We, we close our services with a time of prayer because this is a way to serve one another. This is a way to shepherd one another. This is a way to walk well with one another. And so a prayer leader will have a, a badge on there letting you know, hey, I'd love to pray with you this morning. But there's one up here by the cross. There'll be one up here on my left, your right, one back by the double doors and one back by the sound booth. And we just ask during this time, unless there's an emergency, just that you don't leave. You know, stuff comes up, but just kind of hang here in this moment. We won't be very long. But I want to pray for you, and then I want to invite you to come as well. Will you stand with me here in the house? And those that are joining online, maybe you'll stand, maybe you'll whatever, but let me pray for you. God, there have been very large decisions that have been made in this room this morning. And the reality is, whether we're asking for the strength to forgive another person, or whether we're trusting your forgiveness as being enough for us, we're going to need you. We're going to need your spirit to empower us, to draw us to that place, to sustain us in that place as well. And I'm asking, would you do that? I'm also asking that you would let all of these people know that they have a family right here at Lighthouse Community who will walk with them through this. And I also pray, Holy Spirit, that you would draw every single person who needs prayer right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about Lighthouse Community, check out our website at mylighthousecommunity.com or connect with us on Facebook. You're invited to join us live Sunday mornings at 909 or 1111.